Okay, we've been talking about <coughs> Susanna uh, Annesley, uh, and she had the occasion to meet Samuel Wesley uh, at a wedding, and they realized that they were kindred spirits, uh, and so they eventually got married. They eventually got married. Samuel married Susanna. Uh, and then they moved uh, into the rectory at South Ormsby in Lincolnshire uh, in 1691 because Samuel was an Anglican priest. He was an Anglican priest. Um, and if you know anything about Samuel's biography, he didn't know how to handle money very well. And he was always pressed for money and often in financial trouble, financial difficulties. And so he was trying to add some resources to the meager income he would receive uh, as a rector. And so uh, he would publish in journals and received some money for publishing. So he published in the Athenian Gazette, the Athenian Gazette. Um, and then a little later on in 1696 or so, the Wesleys moved from South Ormsby to Epworth, to the historic uh, rectory there at Epworth in Lincolnshire where Samuel served as the rector. He served as the rector there. Um, Samuel actually believed he had received this appointment uh, through no one less than Queen Mary in appreciation for a work that Samuel had published in defense of the Glorious Revolution. The Glorious Revolution, if you know your English history, uh, happened in 1688. Uh, it's when the English cashiered out James because they thought he was too Catholic, Roman Catholic, and they invited uh, William, William of Orange, William and Mary, Mary Stuart, the daughter, uh, to the English throne, to the English throne. And so uh, Samuel was very much in favor of that of that change, very much in favor of that change. Uh, although we're going to see in a few moments that Susanna, Susanna was not. Uh, Susanna was not. Okay. Now, Samuel was what we could call a Tory in politics. And that may be hard to translate into contemporary political jargon and Oftentimes, you hear the word conservative, um, but uh, Samuel was in favor of the legitimacy of William of Orange and of his Queen Mary, who was the daughter of James II. James II, who had been cashiered out of the British, of the English throne. Um, and Samuel was very much in favor uh, of this transition that took place. Now, something you need to understand that in England at this time, and, and this is, of course, we're talking about 17th and 18th century, that religion and the government, religion and politics are very much intermixed. So that if you have a change in the political scene or the government scene, you lots of times have a change in religion. So they're intermixed, um, and that will be different for other lands. In my country, for example, these are utterly separated. Religion is one thing, the government is another. But not so uh, in England during this period, uh, in the 17th and 18th century, they're intermixed, uh, very much so. Um, now, Samuel Wesley finds out that his wife, uh, Susanna, does not share, does not share his politics. Could that make for marital trouble? Uh, yes, yes it could. Uh, and 
One night when Samuel was praying, he noticed that his wife had not said amen to the prayer for King William. She didn't say amen. So Samuel asked her about that. You know, why didn't you say amen to the prayer for King William? And then she revealed that she believed that James II, James Stuart, who had been cashiered out of the English throne, was actually the rightful king of England. Okay? So what do we call that? We say that Susanna was a Jacobite. Jacobite, you know, the Latin uh, form of James. In other words, she favored James II, James Stuart, that he was the rightful king of England. She didn't make the transition to William. So Samuel Wesley was upset with his wife. He was very upset with his wife. And so he took a rash vow. He took a rash vow and he said to her, his pet name for her was Suki. He called her Suki and he said, Suki, if that be the case, we must part. For if we have two kings, we must have two beds. And with the kind of stubbornness that only emerges from a deeply principled person, Samuel abandoned his wife and his children and headed for London. Just how long Samuel was gone, we're not exactly sure, and scholars debate about this. Uh, but the neglectful husband and father finally returned to the Epworth Rectory. However, without having received the kinds of assurances from Susanna that he had demanded in his vow. Um, and so Samuel comes back, but Susanna doesn't change her views. She doesn't change her views at all. She's still a Jacobite, okay? Now, watch this. Within a year after Samuel's return, John Wesley was born. John Wesley was born on June 17th, June 17th, 1703. Now, you might say to yourself, hmm, John Wesley was born on June 17th, 1703. How could that be? I've read in some books that John Wesley was born on June 28th. What gives? June 17th, one book says. June 28th, another book says. Well, uh, it has something to do uh, with the calendar with the calendar uh, and the fact that um, the English in the 18th century were still on, what calendar were they on? The Julian calendar. What's the Julian calendar? That's the calendar that goes all the way back to Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar is the one who adjusted the calendar and gave us, what did he give us? Leap year. So that every four years we add a day. It usually becomes February, what, 29th? February 29th? So that's leap year, okay? Um, and, but the Julian calendar has slippage because it actually takes the Earth uh, uh, a little less time to go to revolve around the sun than the Julian calendar allows. Now you might say, well, this is minor, but think about it, over time, over centuries, there's lots of slippage. Uh, and by the time we got to the 18th century, that slippage was 11 days, 11 days, okay? So what happens? The English finally go over to What's this new calendar they're going over to? Ah, oh, it was Gregorian. And who was, who was Gregory? Who was Gregory? He was the Pope. He was the Pope. And, and the English didn't want to go over to that papist calendar. And so they were on the old Julian calendar. And they didn't go over to the Gregorian calendar, named after Pope Gregory 
who made the proper adjustments, okay, uh, and they did not go over until 1752. So John Wesley celebrates his birthday on June 17th, all the way up till 1752. Then what happens? June 28th. Because the English add 11 days all at once. And the people in London are upset. They go, you took our 11 days. Give us back our 11 days. They're gone. You took them away. <laughs> so it's kind of crazy. But there are two different dates of John Wesley's birthday. And it corresponds to the Julian calendar on one hand and the Gregorian calendar on the other. Okay. Now, I suppose I have a little more interest uh, in this topic uh, because my firstborn child was born on June 28th, June 28th uh, on John Wesley's birthday. And then my grandson was born June 17th. Uh, I think God has a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter and my grandson were both born on John Wesley's birthday. Surely God has a sense of humor. <laughs> so, yes. Now, the Wesley family, the Wesley family was large. It was large, even by 18th century standards, and consisted of 18 or 19, we're not exactly sure, 18 or 19 children in the Wesley household. Susanna must have constantly been pregnant uh, to have so many children. And John was the 15th. He was the 15th child uh, who was born to Su uh, Samuel and Susanna, Susanna Wesley. Okay. Now, as you might imagine, uh, due to the medical practices of the day, many of these children who are born, they never live to adulthood. They don't live to adulthood. Many of them died as infants, even before they were one year, were one year old, they died. Uh, and so uh, families tended to have a lot of children uh, in order to secure uh, their living later on when they were elderly, or in many cases, uh, in terms of farmers, for example, uh, in terms of labor, because the children would be laborers to help support the family household. That was very much the situation in, in 18th century uh, England. Well, with a large family, you know, 18 or 19 children, though. Uh, as many as nine died as infants, as many as nine died as infants. And that was fairly typical uh, during this period of time. Medical practices uh, in some respects, and I've read the primary accounts, uh, some of them were very primitive, uh, even harmful. <laughs> a patient goes to a doctor and they're more greatly harmed <laughs> than before they came. Uh, that would often be the case. Um, so Samuel, with this large family, of course, is pressed financially. He's pressed financially. He has many mouths to feed, many children to clothe and to take care of. Uh, and so he was frequently in debt. Uh, unlike modern times, in England in the 18th century, there was such a thing as debtor's prison. You could go to jail because you owed money. Yes, uh, that was the situation in 18th, 18th, century, um, 18th century England. And you probably already have a sense that Samuel Wesley is a person of strong views, strong views, both religious views and political views in terms of governance, King William, for example. And there was a local election. There was a local election. And Samuel Wesley came out for a slate of candidates. He, he favored a slate of candidates. And he came out publicly and said, I support, I support 
this candidate. Then, upon getting more information, he got more information, he changed his mind and he said, well, now I support these other, this other candidate. Well, the first candidate did not like that, okay? And Samuel Wesley owed money to this first candidate. And that person called in the loan and said, pay up, pay up. And Samuel said, I can't, I don't have the money. Off to prison you go. And so Samuel Wesley went off to prison, again, left his wife and his children. He went to debtor's prison because this loan was called in. This loan was called in because Wesley had changed his mind politically, politically. <laughs> now, Susanna's situation uh, at the Epworth Rectory became known it became known among the English clergy. And there was a kindly archbishop. His name was Archbishop Sharp. And he went to visit Susanna, uh, and he gathered up some financial support so that he could help Susanna uh, and her family. Uh, and he questioned her in terms of what was her situation like? And Susanna's answer is very interesting. It's very terse, it's very brief, but it says, it speaks volumes. It speaks volumes uh, in very, very few words. And so the archbishop asked her this question. He said, is your situation so bad that you ever wanted bread? That's what the bishop asks her, okay? And then she replies, very forthrightly, uh, she replies, my lord, he's a bishop, my lord, I will freely own to your grace that strictly speaking, I never did want bread, but then I had so much care to get it before it was eat and to pay for it after, as has often made it very unpleasant to me. Wow. <laughs> so what is Susanna saying in that reply? Well, she's saying, well, there's bread on the table. Yes, that's true. But we have so much care and concern to make sure it's on the table that we can hardly enjoy it. In other words, we have so much anxiety about the basic maintenance needs of life. In other words, will we have enough to eat today? Uh, and so you can see that um, you can see that Susanna Wesley, uh, Samuel Wesley, that this rectory at Epworth was impoverished. Yes, this is poverty. Okay, now I want to make a point here because you need to see something, especially, oh, we people in the 21st century, the way we think about things, okay, because the way we think about things, when we look back on this, we, we misunderstand. So I'm going to make a statement. It's going to be a bold statement. It'll be like a splash of cold water in the face. John Wesley grew up in a rich home. Yes, rich. Of course, riches and poverty is not simply about money. That's the modern misunderstanding. That's the modern misunderstanding. We get, uh, and it's fed by Marxism, by the way. It's fed by Marxism. Materialism, what we shall eat, what we shall drink. Those things are important. Even Jesus talked about that. But they're not the most important of all. The Gentiles, Jesus said, are concerned about those things. The Wesley family, this is a rich family. How so? How so? How do you talk about that? Rich in values. The inculcation of values. The love of God. The love of learning. The desire to improve oneself and to be a better person. To create that nurturing, comforting environment in which uh, all of the boys become ordained Anglican priests. Samuel, 
John Wesley and Charles Wesley, they all become Church of England priests. This is a very special environment. I hope you see that. It's rich. John Wesley grew up in a rich home. Not in terms of money. That's the modern misunderstanding. That's all we see. Things, stuff. We need to see the invisible. Spirit, mind, soul, God, heart, education, knowledge. These are the things that make a person rich indeed. Amen. Yeah. And so John Wesley, and I say this without, without qualification. John and Charles and Samuel were privileged. They had advantages because of the home they grew up in that others did not have. And they had a lot of money. You see? You see the difference? You see what I'm talking about? Okay. So, financially, yes, financially pinched in so many different ways. And we're going to see that again and again and again. Uh, especially with Samuel, because he just didn't know how to manage money uh, very well. Um, um, so, look at the perspective of Susanna. Her husband is often gone. He's often gone at convocation, and she has several children for whom she's responsible. And how do you do that? How do you raise so many children? Children want to go all different directions. You, they need governance. They need care. They need direction, OK? Because the judgment of children is not good. How could it be? They lack the experience out of which good judgment comes. And so part of the role of a parent is to provide that good judgment that a child lacks, child's just aiming at whatever feels good, whatever is attractive, you see? And that can get one into trouble very quickly, very quickly. Uh, and so Susanna is going to be something of a disciplinarian. Uh, I've heard people say from time to time, well, the reason it's called Methodism is because of the method of Susanna Wesley in raising up her, her children. Um, and so, she taught all of her children uh, the alphabet uh, when they were very young. Uh, she also taught them how to read. Everyone, boys and girls included, taught them how to read. And she also spent time with each child in a fixed pattern in terms of the state of their soul. So Susanna Wesley realized it's not enough simply to clothe and to feed my children. It's not enough simply to educate them so that they can read. That's not enough. That I must also inquire concerning religious and spiritual matters. And so on each day of the week, Susanna would have a private talk with one of her children in accordance with a fixed pattern. So on Monday, she would have this talk with Molly, on Tuesday with Hetty, on Wednesday with Nancy, on Thursday with John. And John later on in life, when he was an adult, he would look back upon this time with his mother and it was precious to him, oh, so precious. This, this converse, these conversations about religious matters that he used to have with his mother uh, on Thursdays. And then on Friday with Patty, on Saturday with Charles, and on Sunday with Amelia and Suki. And six hours a day were spent at school uh, where instruction was serious and thorough and loud talking and boisterous playing was strictly prohibited, okay? And so uh, you can see some of Susanna's early Puritan heritage shining through her educational philosophy. And she passes that on to John, by the way, because Susanna, at school, there should be no playing. And when John Wesley later on establishes the Kingswood School, no playing. Uh, and when he was questioned about that, 
Wesley's response was, if they play as children, they'll play as adults. And so, strictly prohibited. Now, my students from time to time, they ask me, you know, where does your thought differ from John Wesley's? And uh, this is one area where it does differ. Uh, I think, in my understanding of education, uh, playing in terms of children is very important. It's the way they process the world. It's the way they learn. It's the way they grow. Uh, it enhances their imagination. It, it stretches them in so many different ways. So I would affirm the importance of playing. And then all the social benefits, working with others. Um, cooperating with others, uh, relating to others, so important. And that emerges out of play as well. So I, I do differ with John Wesley here in terms of his, uh, his educational uh, philosophy. Now, I can't go through all the rules that um, Susanna laid down, uh, because John Wesley writes to her later on when he's an adult uh, and he asked her to collect the principal rules that she used to raise her children. Uh, and she did that. She wrote back in a piece of correspondence. Um, and I want you to see, I want you to see her, her basic counsel, the basic counsel that she offered. In other words, the most general counsel. And then there are some particulars underneath. But the general counsel, we need to see that because I think it's at the heart of what religious education is all about. And this is what she wrote to her son. She said, uh, she talked about what would be the proper foundation, the proper foundation for a religious education. And this is what she wrote to John, quote, in order to form the minds of children, the first thing to be done is to conquer their will. I insist upon conquering the wills of children betimes because this is the only foundation of a religious education. When this is thoroughly done, then a child is capable of being governed by the reason of its parent until its own understanding comes to maturity, end of quote. Well, there's actually quite a lot there, and I want to unpack a bit of it because it's important. Uh, I'll start out <laughs> just by saying right away that Susanna Wesley, no surprise here, has been criticized by 21st century types who say, oh, this is, this is too much. You know, just let the children do whatever they want. It's okay. You know, just, and they, they immediately sweep her counsel out of hand. But I think Susanna Wesley is wiser. And I'm going to make a case why she's wiser. I'm going to demonstrate. I'm going to argue why she's wiser here. And first of all, first of all, she is focused. What is she focused on? She's focused on the will. She's focused on the will, that the will has to be conquered. What is the will? Well, the will is what we desire, what we want, what we give ourselves to, uh, even what we're, we're conquered by, perhaps, some object of the will. Uh, and so she's focused on that, that as human beings, we are ever seeking value. We're ever seeking value. Everyone, everyone is seeking value. Uh, some people go after false value. In other words, they go after a good that they think is a real good, but it's only an apparent good. It's not really good. Like, for example, the person uh, who does uh, Cocaine for the first time, just to give an example. Oh, this is pleasurable. This is good. I want this. This is valuable. It's good. I want this. And then, but then over time, oh, it's not good. It's bad. It's evil. Because it's destroying what we need, which is health. <laughs> it's destroying that. Destroying our relationships and leading, therefore, to misery. Okay? Uh, so this issue of the will. What we value, what we love, what we want, what we desire, 
what we give ourselves to, what we're oriented, what we're concerned about, what we think is valuable, that's all important. It's at the heart of religion. Yeah, it's at the heart of religion. So Susanna got this piece right, the will and the transformation of the will, rightly loving that which should be loved and not loving those things that prevent us from loving what we should love, namely God and neighbor, okay? Uh, and so what does Susanna say? I insist, insist, that's a strong word. I insist upon conquering the wills of children because that is the only foundation of a religious education. Now, notice that this is not forever. Susanna is wise here because she recognizes what? That children are children, they're not adults. And this is the mistake we often make today in the 21st century. We think, we think children are little adults, you know, with all this great judgment and great experience. Uh, they don't have that. They don't. And if you don't recognize that as a parent, you're making a huge mistake, and someone needs to tell you that for the sake of the child, okay? But Susanna is saying here, it is the parent's reason, the parent's reason which has good judgment, in other words, knows those objects that we should rightly be aiming at that are worthy of our will desiring. The parent's reason and judgment is good and will stay in place until, until the child's own understanding comes to maturity. And that will happen. So it's a kind of governance of the child because their judgment is not good. They lack experience. They have little experience, which will make them naive in the face of evil at times because they lack experience, whereas the parents, they know. Uh, but then there'll come a point when the parent can hand it over, if you will, <laughs> to the teenager, the young adult, whatever, because their reason is now developed, their judgment is informed, they understand what they should rightly give themselves to. So I think there's a lot of wisdom, actually, uh, wisdom that we can use today in the 21st century church uh, in Susanna's reply. There's lots of, of wisdom here. Now, um, I'm, oh, I'm not going to talk about all the bylaws that Susanna list, listed after this general principle, but I do want to lift up one. Uh, and it has, to do, uh, it has to do with the education of girls. Um, and so, as you might imagine, uh, in the 18th century, that many girls were left ignorant. They were left ignorant because they were illiterate. Uh, they did not know how to read. They did not know how to write. And why? Why did, did the girls not know how to read and write? Because they were sent out to work. They were sent out to work early on by families so that the families could receive the financial support. Uh, and Susanna is well aware that this is going on in 18th century England, and she basically is saying, not in my house, not in my house. And so one of her rules was that no girl be taught to work till she can read very well. No girl be taught to work till she can read well very well. And then that she be kept to her work with the same application and for the same time that she was held to in reading. And so Susanna is balancing here work and reading, that, that her girls will be readers, they will be literate, uh, and indeed one of the daughters, Hetty, is quite intelligent, uh, very gifted even. You see that in the correspondence, in the letters, um, uh, very gifted. Uh, and so Susanna wanted to make sure uh, that this was in place. 
Now, how do we address this further issue? Though Susanna is attentive to her girls in terms of reading, uh, this 18th century England is a patriarchal society. I, that, that is descriptively accurate. It's appropriate to use that. It's patriarchal in this way, that boys had advantages and privileges simply given to them that were not given to girls. And it was not given to girls precisely because they were girls and not because they lacked an intellect. For example, Hetty was very bright, very bright, intellectually gifted. I just told you that. But Hetty never went to university. All the sons, all three of the sons, Samuel, John, Charles, all are Oxford educated. So the education, the university education was for the boys, not for the girls. This is patriarchy. Patriarchy in the sense, and I'm clearly defining my terms, in the sense that your sex determined opportunities. It, it opened doors or closed doors just simply because of your sex. This, this is 18th century England. This is 18th century. So Suzanne is working within that context, but she wants her daughters to be literate. And one reason, of course, she wants her daughters to be able to read the Bible and to know the Bible well, and to know the Bible well. OK? Um, so um, now, despite this regularity of discipline that Suzanne is bringing to the home. Uh, the Wesley family was just, well, I'm going to stop and take questions. I said I would, and we have to stop. So let's take questions, comments. Questions, comments about anything? Yes. I'm not getting it. Is it channel 15? 11. Oh. Okay, let me. Um. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. Thank you. Yes, um, and we don't know for sure. Yeah, we don't know for sure, first of all, how large the family was, because you notice I said 18 or 19. So we're not ac actually sure uh, in terms of the number. And then in terms of how many survived, we're therefore not exactly sure about that as well. So yes, we don't have definite answers there. Yeah. How do you raise the volume on this? Um, the same button once you change the channel. Yeah, every time I do it, it changes the channel. OK, OK. Wait for a few seconds. Yeah, OK, thank you, thank you. Yes? Yes. What about the father? Did he influence at all? Yeah. Um, in terms of the children, in terms of the children, um, it's really the mother, Susanna, who seems to be most influential. I did a study one time and, and wrote and published an article on John Wesley's relationship with his father. And I discovered something very interesting, that 
if John Wesley had a concern about practical Christian living, in other words, how do, how do I live the Christian life in a very practical way, he turned to Susanna. He asked Susanna, what should I do? If it was a more technical theological issue, like predestination and the intricacies of infralapsarianism or sublapsarianism, he turned to Samuel. Okay, so I think that Susanna has a great influence on the children because she's raising them in many respects. And at times, Samuel is not even present. He's gone. He's off to convocation or he's in prison. So the influence of Susanna on the children is very, very strong. Um, later in life, John turns to his father for technical theological questions, but he gets more in terms of practical Christian living from Susanna. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. For how long Samuel was in the prison? Or was that only one time? Uh, he was in, we don't know exactly, I don't know exactly offhand how long he was in prison. Um, and I'd have to double check on if is this the only time. I'd have to go look. So I'm not sure about that either. And I don't, so I don't want to say. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um. About the years. What's that? About the many, many, many years. Um, I, I don't know. I'd have to go back and check. I'd have to go back and check the primary sources in terms of exactly how long was he in prison. I, I don't have that offhand in my mind. Uh, so, other other questions, comments? Yes. Yes, um, Susanna Wesley um, was not a university graduate. Samuel was. Samuel went as a servitor to Oxford. Susanna, though Susanna is also very gifted, very bright, we can tell that by her letters. Uh, she did not go to university, so you see it again, again, different for men and women different for boys and girls, educational experiences, and that has to do with the opportunities afforded uh, in this particular culture, yes. So in that sense, it's patriarchal, yes. Yes. I'm sorry. It's my fault. We'll get we'll be there in a second. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Oh, of Susanna? Yes. Yes. Yeah, there's a book published by Charles Wallace. Charles Wallace, it's called The Writings of Susanna Wesley. You can see it on Amazon. Go on Amazon. The Writings of Susanna Wesley by Charles Wallace. And in that book, you will find the details of your question. In other words, her method will be laid out very carefully there. <laughs> 